And we go on with another startup case study. And I'm just going to tell you that uh, Ian, who is going to take the stage right now, is one of the uh, is the top 100 most influential British entrepreneurs. He has won the European Founders of the World uh, of the Year Award at Europe S, and he has built one of the hottest tech education startups in Europe, from idea to exit and then growing again. The story of Natalie by Ian Kraihan. Thank you. Yeah, the funny thing is that I'm not even British, I'm German. Um, but the birds. Okay, so why I, am I here? I, I will tell you a little bit of the story of Mendeley. And uh, part of the story I want to tell you about is I want to share a success story to encourage you to continue with your ideas and uh, your ambitions. But a success story also always has another side of the medal. Basically, uh, the, the sad story of every success story, and it's not that easy. And I'm also going to share a little bit of the background of, of the hard parts of building Mendeley. Let me quickly start uh, about describing what Mendeley is. Mendeley is a research collaboration platform, which we started as three PhD students during our university time. So we were re researchers, and we had to organize hundreds, if not thousands, of PDF documents, published articles that scientists publish, write, and publish. And then we, as PhD students, as scientists, as academics, need to organize. So we developed the software, which runs on Mac, Windows, Linux. You can drag and drop the PDF documents uh, into the application. We have mobile apps, and so on. And what it then does, Mendeley then extracts information intelligently from those PDF documents and sets up your uh, digital library of research papers quite automatically. You can then also um, open those documents as a PDF reader and make highlights and annotations within those PDF documents. And then, of course, because research is an inherently social activity, right? I have co-authors, I work in a lab, I meet colleagues at conferences, you can then also share those research papers with your colleagues in a shared group. So you have a productivity aspect and you have a collaboration aspect. Then the kicker was we thought, wow, if we had, let's say, four million scientists in this world using Mendeley, if you could anonymously aggregate all the information, that would be very clever. Because then we could say, what are people researching in the US? What are they doing in, in, in China or Japan? What is the hot topic in computer science right now? And so on. And so we did. So we aggregated all that information in the cloud and were able to build recommendation algorithms, connect people to each other based on what they're researching, and so on. And funnily enough, in the end, we made it to 4 million scientists using the platform. And the 15 largest user bases are also quite nice. We are really well established at the big universities in this world. And on top of that, we have a community of 2,500 so-called Mendeley advisors who represent Mendeley, what we stand for opening up science, opening up academia around the world on campuses for free, just simply because they believe that this is the right thing, what we are doing. That has led to a tremendous amount of positive feedback. So imagine researchers sitting in their lab and not having any exciting tools to work with. Now, in the normal, in the private world, in our private uh, uh, lives, we have the coolest tools that we could use, right? With Facebook, Twitter, photo sharing, uh, so, uh, social music service, and so on, but nothing in academia. And that was why people then started to write about Mendeley, like a quote here is, Mendeley is the bomb for academic gangsters looking to blow it up or raw like. Mm. So very nice uh, quotes that we really like to hear and that has helped us to, to, to be motivated to build the business. So in essence, I think there has never been a better time to build a business. And, and so this is, this is the, uh, the nice part. The other nice part of it when we started is we were completely unexperienced. We didn't have any experience in building a previous business, and that was good. Because had we known how difficult it was, we wouldn't even have started in the first place. Now, these were us three uh, when we started to raise funds, and we raised money with a relatively uh, well-known business angel who's now running a VC fund in London called Stefan Glenzer, and who, who himself was a very successful entrepreneur. So he built and sold a couple of uh, high-profile companies, primarily either in Germany or in London. And we also had the founders of Skype um, and 
uh, some of the people behind uh, big music companies on board. And we raised a lot, lo loads of money. In total, we raised about 12 million euros uh, in venture capital. And it's great, right? It's a fantastic story we built. All, um, all fancy offices and, uh, and had free breakfast and all this kind of stuff. Now, the problem that you then have with that, if things don't go well, you are tied into a burn rate that is quite high. And you have set certain expectations. Now, what happens if your plan doesn't work out? Your burn rate is high and uh, your bank account nears, uh, the, in, in, well, nears the zero. That was the situation that we were facing. So we had raised loads of, uh, loads of money and uh, we were actually in a situation that we needed to go out to investors again. But the problem that we had is that the traction that we had and the revenues that we had were not sufficiently good enough to continue to allow us to raise uh, yet another round. So eventually we ended up in a situation where we were talking to just one London-based VC. Um, they seemed to be nice guys, and eventually we were able to get a term sheet from this VC. And consider this was really our only option because all the other uh, VCs were not really interested, they didn't really understand the educational technology space, uh, not even academia, they were worried there was not enough money in that space and so on. So we had this one uh, venture capitalist. And venture capitalists are very clever, right? They at some point figured out that they were the only ones who had given us a term sheet. So we were basically in a, in a, in a, in a very difficult situation from our point of view, but we trusted them. What then happened is, post term sheet, so we had agreed the basic terms of the following investment round, which was not great, but okay to continue. And post that term sheet, um, the VC turned around and I got a call one day and, and, then, and, 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 and one of the partners at the VC said, ah, by the way, um, we, unfortunately we thought about this again, we have to change the term. Uh, something that is uh, not very nice, but can happen. So I said, okay, fair enough. Um, we, um, we accepted it because we didn't have any other choice. Uh, and we moved on. One week later, the VC called again and said, ah, by the way, we have to change yet another term. In this case, I, I still remember it was an anti-dilution protection, which means that if you vote for down round, uh, there was an over-proportional benefit to the new incoming investor. And uh, again, though not happy, um, we said, okay, for the sake of it, because we had really fun, we wanted to continue. But I also said to them, said, if this happens again, like, I, I don't think it's a very solid relationship for us to build because we want to work together for the next five to 10 years to build this business. So if you come around every once in a while and up front already and change terms that we have previously agreed, I don't think that builds a very good relationship. Now guess what? They called a third time. And then in this case, the term they wanted to change was renewed founder vesting, which is basically a term that um, you know, helps the VC to uh, let's say get some confidence that if a founder was to leave after the round, uh, they, they would lose parts of their shares. Now to us who had built this business already four years, it was kind of a, you know, the VC comes in and takes everything away already from us. So for us that was kind of a breaking point. Plus there were two incidents before and we had two months of cash in the bank. At that point uh, we said, actually that's a no-go. Uh, we will not um, continue conversations. And we actually said to ourselves, well, you know, we had four years fun. We will not continue this business. You know, we go to our investors, tell them our, our existing investors, tell them the decision that we are not prepared to continue with that specific VC. And, um, and then we, you know, close, close down and uh, try something else. That was uh, a very, very difficult moment was in 2012, in the beginning of 2012, I, I, I can really remember that. Uh, and so we went to the investors, our existing investors, and they were actually so impressed with that decision that we said, we're not prepared to basically do a deal um, under any condition, that they said, okay, then we extend um, the funding for you with a convertible loan of two million, and you go out and start the whole fundraising process again. So we took that money and said, okay, two million from you as a convertible loan. We continued the conversation, uh, went out again, found yet another VC who was then willing to give another one and a half million dollars, uh, euros uh, to allow us to continue. And then uh, we basically were able to, to fund operations again. Uh, and to what that led, I'll, I'll come in the next slide. My 
what I want to say there is, I think my feeling, my takeaway from that is that we back then had the opinion that failure actually can only be temporary. Because if that hasn't worked out, wouldn't have worked out, we would have done something else and eventually that would have worked. Or maybe the third, third attempt and so on. So I think it's uh, a kind of attitude that you develop towards such a very different situation. And actually, right, everything that's easy will not really make you feel satisfied. Right? If you think back about the hard challenges that you had in life, usually the stuff that was really difficult for you, then you have the best memories. Eventually, so one year later, we were able to sell. Well, actually, we didn't need to sell because we were funded again. But then a very big company came along and uh, made us an offer that was so good that we could not uh, basically uh, not, say, not say no to that offer. So one year later, after almost going bankrupt, we sold the business to um, one of the largest or the largest academic publisher, Elsevier. Uh, and so here we are. It's, it's, it has been an incredible journey from almost bankrupt to eventually being able to sell the business. Now, the other thing I think that's important to, to keep in mind uh, when you think about success stories. Success stories never are a success story of one, two, or even three years. If you look at that graph, you will see how long it roughly takes for a startup company or technology heavy company to actually be successful. And by successful, the definition here is, let's say, $50 million in revenue, or let's say a company is being acquired for that amount of sum. And you will see on average, it takes about, well, eight, nine, 10 years for a company to get to that point. Yes, there are like rocket ships, but there are also slow burners, as you can see. So if you go into this and start your own business, keep in mind that this will always be a longer journey. Now, I've been part of Elsevier since April 2013. So now my life has changed again. Now I'm an entrepreneur inside the corporate. And that was my first reaction. I was like, my God, what's going on, right? It's, it's really like night and day. And you think like the processes are killing me. It's impossible to work in such an environment. But then you think like, hmm, that's actually interesting, right? Elsevier is the market leader in that space, so they must be doing something right. And so it's about figuring out how this system works as an entrepreneur. And, and you know, before you were able to make a decision in, a fly, uh, in an instant, in a moment, now you have, like, say, meetings with 15 or 20 people, but for good reason, because you have so much knowledge in that company. And of course, you need to bring all the people along the way. So the position that I've now adopted is not, let's say, uh, how to survive or just keep your focus on, on, on survival. But actually, keep going, right? Keep going, keep going with the flow, and uh, take this as, an, as, a, as, a, as a journey. Because actually, I think uh, the fact that I'm now able to see, uh, as an entrepreneur, how a startup can grow within a bigger company is actually quite a privilege in my view. So, and in fact, if you look back in April 2013, we were about roughly 50 people. And again, consider that a month before, uh, a year before, we were almost uh, uh, at the point where we had to shut the doors. Now, as we speak today, the team has massively increased. So we were never able, we would never have been able to raise that amount of money with an external investor that would allow us to grow to almost 200 people by now. And I think the, the attitude that has allowed us to go there is, it's not only me, but it's the whole team is kind of, you know, keep your eyes on what you actually want to do, which is building the research collaboration platform for the world, and keep going, right? Keep going and take this as, um, uh, uh, yeah, as, a, as a journey for, um, for yourself and, and that you are able to, um, to appreciate that. This is the new office that we have moved into. Before, we were like really in a kind of uh, a garage. It was a, like a workshop-style office, but now we are able to move into this bigger office and the team that we, we are having now, Mendeley, within Elsevier, is actually now the spearhead of digital development, digital product development for such a big company. And we are helping to, to shift the whole company uh, more towards digital. Now, the conclusions for me out of that, and what I want to uh, give you for, 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 you know, for your way and, and to think about. For me, it has always been the most difficult part to deal with the emotions that are associated with this kind of roller coaster. Um, because every day you, you experience something new, and then suddenly you see it's not going too well, 
um, and the, the business almost needs to shut. And then a year later, you couldn't be any, any happier than, than we were. And now we have a lot of frustration within a corporate company, but at the same time, you see how the business is growing, something that I would never have been able to pull off just on my own. So this balance, this constant sh uh, shifting between positive and negative emotions has always been the hardest part for me. And the way how I managed to um, mitigate that challenge is actually I, I was always looking uh, for people to enjoy the ride with. These are, of course, your co-founders, but it's also about the team, building the team around, the team around you, building, uh, building a company culture. And as I mentioned a couple of times already, it's kind of a journey, right? I have adopted this mindset of I take entrepreneurship as a lifestyle. I still consider myself an entrepreneur in every company, but the way I operate is still uh, very entrepreneurial, and that is, of course, leading to frustrations. But I think, well, that's part of my journey, and had the business had to shut down in 2012, I would be still doing uh, an entrepreneurial business right now. So thank you for listening to my story, and uh, I think we have a couple of more minutes if you have questions to me. Thank you. So do we have any questions? So I have a question. Ah. If nobody has any question, I have a question. I wanted to ask you, why have you decided to stay with the company after the exit as well? Uh, well, it's, it's about the team and it's about the mission in this case. So we really wanted to build this research collaboration platform for academics. And whether you did this, do this via external capital or via a partner like Elsevier, uh, for me, uh, you know, part, uh, the, the better partner now was Elsevier because they had much deeper pockets. And they gave us the firepower to actually execute on what we wanted to do. Plus, you have a great team around yourself, so there's no reason to run away. Did the dynamics in the team change afterward? Well, I guess many other people as well became frustrated with uh, slow processes and bureaucracy, yes. But at the same time, you, didn't, you don't need to worry about your paycheck anymore, right? So there's always something that, that has to give. You have to give up something for something else. And if you have these discussions and educate yourself about that situation, I think yeah, you can deal with it. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.